This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Narmeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. We begin today's show looking at the war in Ukraine. On Wednesday, a Russian missile hit an outdoor market in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region, killing 17 and injuring 32. It was one of the deadliest attacks in Ukraine in months. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky condemned the, quote, utter inhumanity of the attack. Diana Khodak, who works in a pharmacy next to the market, described the missile strike. I only saw a flash and then shouted to my colleagues, lie on the floor. All the customers lay down on the floor. All the pharmacy employees lay down on the floor. I heard things falling over. Then everything was covered in smoke and fire started. One wounded woman walked into the pharmacy on her own. Her arm and her leg were bleeding. She had a big wound on her arm. Another woman was scared inside by soldiers. She had an open fracture and her bone was sticking out from her leg. She was very pale. She remained conscious but in shock while she was given first aid. The attack on the Ukrainian market occurred as U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken made a surprise visit to Kyiv, where he met with President Zelensky. Blinken announced $1 billion in new U.S. aid to Ukraine. We will continue to stand by Ukraine's side, and today we're announcing new assistance totaling more than $1 billion in this common effort. That includes $665.5 million in new military and civilian security assistance. Uh, in total, we committed over $43 billion in, assist in security assistance since the beginning of the Russian aggression. In Moscow, the Kremlin criticized Blinken's visit, saying it's proof the United States plans to keep funding Ukraine's war effort, quote, until the last Ukrainian. We're joined now by two activists, one Russian, one Ukrainian. They're on a speaking tour of the United States, organized by the Ukraine Solidarity Network, a group which supports Ukraine's struggle for self-determination. Ilya Budraitskis is a Russian historian and political theorist who was previously based in Moscow and recently joined University of California, Berkeley, as a visiting scholar. He's co-founder of POSLE which means after a network of Russian intellectuals in exile who oppose the war against Ukraine. He's the author of the award-winning book Dissidents Among Dissidents, Ideology, Politics and the Left in Post-Soviet Russia. Hanna Perhoda is a Ukrainian historian at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. She's a member of the Ukrainian Democratic Socialist Organization, uh, which is called Sozialny Ruch. She's also part of the European Network for Solidarity with Ukraine, we welcome you both uh, to New York uh, and to the United States and to Democracy Now! Um, Hannah, we want to begin with you. Can you describe what's happening to your country now, uh, your response to the latest attack in the Donetsk region? In fact, Hannah, are you also from the Donetsk region? Yeah, uh, basically, the essence of this war um, is the same as one year before. That means that most of the Ukrainians living in any part of the country are uh, facing a threat uh, of Russian missiles um, targeting their residential areas, because Russia has engaged itself in a strategy of, of terror against uh, civilians. And this continue as we um, can witness it with this horrible attack on uh, on a on a city in the Donetsk region, and yeah, in fact, I'm from this region. And it uh, and it's very painful for me to see all these uh, streets and cities uh, that I spent my childhood uh, in to be uh, completely uh, destroyed by the ongoing war. Uh, but also, what defines uh, this? war is the fact that a great uh, a big part of the Ukrainian territories are still under the Russian occupation and civilians living in these territories are facing um, torture they are facing murder they are facing rape and uh, also forced displacement as well as the mass uh, kidnapping of of children who are sent to Russia in order to be re-educated. That this is something we must not forget, that the reality of this war 
is uh, still um, is still horrible. So, um, but also something which uh, is not fading away um, is the uh, consensus among the Ukrainian population, uh, even despite all the political uh, disagreements inside the Ukrainian population, because it's a complex society. Um, all the citizens of Ukraine are united uh, by, an, by a, um, a strong consensus that uh, only the uh, only the fact only uh, our capability uh, to liberate the whole territory uh, of uh, Ukraine could be a um, uh, precondition for the lasting peace uh, for Ukraine and for the whole region because Russia and Vladimir Putin are still openly denying the very right uh, of Ukrainians to exist as a state and as a separate society from Russia. Uh, Hannah, could you uh, elaborate on that, uh, the, the sense that you have of what the trajectory and the purpose of this war are now uh, for Russia uh, and where you see this, this going? I will try to summarize it uh, because it's a, not uh, it's not an easy it's not it's not an easy war uh, to understand maybe from for uh, from outside but basically uh, this war is not a response for some external military threat for Russia emanating from NATO for example but this war is a response of the Russian ruling classes to the internal internal threat. Uh, to their power, because Russian uh, civil society was quite active uh, on the last uh, the last years, and also um, uh, being under threat of uh, um, <coughs> democratization of democratizing Russian society, uh, the Putin and his clan actually tried to eliminate all possible um, democratizing tendencies uh, in the neighborhood. That's why uh, the war uh, in Ukraine was uh, uh, provoked by Russia in uh, 2014. That's why also Putin uh, invaded it. And it is necessary to understand that the reasons of this war are internal to Russia and has, uh, must, uh, has uh, more to do with the internal politics than with some uh, external international uh, relations uh, 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 between Russia and, uh, for example, the Western countries. Uh, so, uh, actually, we see that um, this—we uh, don't have an easy, um, an easy exit from, from this situation, because uh, Putin doesn't seem to show any um, clear um, demands of what he actually wants from Ukraine. Does he doesn't? Uh, I think this war is not about territories. It's about the full control of Ukraine in order to prevent it to become a prosperous and democratic country. Because um, it may awaken some dangerous ideas among Russians themselves, who are also tired of the autocratic regime and of the extreme inequality uh, in Russia. So, basically, uh, the danger of this war, that even if somehow Ukraine cedes uh, some part of territories or even the whole territory of Ukraine uh, would belong to Russia, uh, the war would continue, because any uh, democratic country on the borders of Russia is a threat for the Putin's regime. Ilya Budraitskis, I'd, I'd like to bring you in uh, to the conversation. We've had you on the show a few times, the first time, in fact, just weeks before the Russian invasion and then on two subsequent uh, occasions uh, when we did not disclose your location, though you had fled the country and now you're at uh, at the uh, UC Berkeley. If you could uh, talk about what the situation now is in Russia, respond to what Hannah said about, uh, you know, the protests that began in Russia in 2011, how they were connected. Uh, you've said that over the last several years, uh, the Russian uh, population has been preparing or has been prepared for this war. Talk about what you know of the situation on the ground there now. 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so basically, I agree with what uh, with, with what just uh, Anna was saying. Uh, this uh, criminal war is not just war against Ukraine. It's it's a war of the Russian regime uh, against its uh, own society. Uh, and this war uh, started not just a year ago. It it started. Uh, uh, as you said, uh, from 2011, uh, then uh, in uh, 2014 with the annexation of Crimea, and somehow you see the uh, combination of the external and internal uh, goals of, uh, of uh, Putin's regime in his uh, actions uh, against his own population and against his neighbors. Uh, so definitely this war is, uh, is uh, ongoing to, to uh, save the, the regime, uh, to strengthen its uh, power over its own population, but it's also about the imperial uh, and imperialist uh, ambitions of uh, Putin's Russia in the post-Soviet space, uh, and probably Ukraine uh, will be not the last uh, goal of this aggression, if the conflict uh, will uh, continue in, in different ways and, and this, uh, this uh, regime will continue to exist. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned, in uh, 2011, uh, Putin was challenged by the rise of the uh, huge protest movement. That was a movement uh, for the democratization of political system, for some more just redistribution of the wealth in the country. Uh, and, in fact, the annexation of uh, Crimea, the rally around the uh, flag uh, that uh, appeared in the Russian society uh, after it uh, was uh, was the answer of the regime uh, to this democratic challenge. Uh, then, uh, even uh, just a few years before the full-scale invasion, you also saw the uh, rise of the new protest movement, uh, even uh, the protest movement of the uh, more younger generation that uh, was not uh, participated in the, in the, in the protests of uh, 2011, and uh, the full-scale invasion uh, of Ukraine uh, somehow marked a significant turn in the very character of the Putin's regime, uh, which uh, became an open uh, and extremely repressive uh, dictatorship. Uh, so, for now, in Russia, you have much more political prisoners uh, that you had, uh, for example, in the late uh, Soviet period under, under Brezhnev. Uh, you have a total uh, censorship, uh, you have an atmosphere of uh, fear, you have the more and more repressive uh, measures uh, coming uh, from the government, uh, but uh, somehow we see that uh, even uh, in this very dramatic situation, there are still many kind of hidden dissent uh, in the uh, Russian society. Mm. I wanted to ask Hanna Parakhoda. Um, Ant uh, Antony Blinken just went to Kyiv in this surprise visit. I think it's his third time. And he made the announcement of billion more dollars in, uh, in aid to the Ukraine war. The counteroffensive, very difficult. The U.S. is now apparently going to promise depleted uranium ammunition before that cluster bombs violating a treaty, not that the U.S. has signed on to, but 110 other countries have signed on to against cluster bombs. I'm wondering about your thoughts on the war. It sounds like, for many of the Ukrainians, there's a lot of pressure to continue to say the war must be supported um, at any cost, because otherwise it means Russia um, can perhaps take over Ukraine or parts of Ukraine very significantly. But you're on an anti-war speaking tour. Um, yeah. Actually, for Ukraine, uh, this is a war of self-defense, and I think it's very important to make a difference between, uh, you know, the use of violence with uh, the aim of aggression and the use of violence with the aim to protect your own existence. Uh, so this is why uh, 
in Ukraine, as I said, all the civic and political organizations are united by uh, this consensus that, uh, you know, the uh, political life in Ukraine, for example, uh, the life of the civil society is possible uh, under the condition, is not possible under the condition of uh, foreign occupation, an occupation by a foreign army, which actually commit uh, war crimes. Uh, so uh, that's why the um, support from other states and weapons are essential for Ukrainians uh, in order to sustain their effort in order to uh, liberate the territory. This is not just about liberating the territories, of course. This is about liberating the cities uh, where our families and friends are living under the constant uh, threat and under the uh, danger of being, as I said, raped and murdered uh, by the occupying forces. And the fact that uh, uh, countries like our partners continue to sustain the military effort of Ukraine uh, is really essential. But I don't think uh, that uh, Ukraine actually receives enough uh, to uh, be really able to um, uh, be in a better position uh, and to um, regain its territories and to for example, start the negotiations from a from a strong position, um, and um, yes. So the uh, question of uh, weapons uh, is essential to us because it's uh, the question of our survival as a society and of our political economic uh, sovereignty. Of course, nobody wants this war to continue, especially Ukrainians. But if we like, I think we must remember that uh, praising compromise with aggressor has never brought peace uh, to anyone. It brought a total war. It brought a total war in 1939, for example. So when we are faced with this kind of uh, state, a Russian state, an obscurantist, ultra-conservative, authoritarian force, uh, we must act in order to defend uh, such th things that often we take for granted being here in the Western countries. And that's what Ukrainians are doing. Um, and if, I mean, if we do not support uh, them in this struggle and if we let Russian authoritarianism win, it will mean that the authoritarian forces also in our countries, in the US, for example, will become uh, stronger. Uh, so this is basically uh, one of the demands and the position that we share, both progressivist uh, in Ukraine, both progressive forces, uh, anti-war Russian forces, uh, we share this perspective that the development of our societies, the peaceful life in both Ukraine and Russia is only possible if uh, Ukraine wins. Ilya, could you uh, also talk about that, uh, you know, where you see the war going, what the trajectory is, uh, and talk about the changes that have been instituted domestically uh, within Russia recently, in particular the controversy around new history textbooks that are being taught in high schools and uh, increasing the age of conscription to increase the number of, of uh, Russian men uh, eligible for uh, service in the military. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, all your <laughs> questions, they somehow uh, related to each other because uh, all it uh, showed that uh, Putin basically is preparing for uh, to continue this, uh, this war, uh, to prepare his, uh, his population, his citizens to, to become uh, soldiers, uh, to, to become a uh, war meat, <laughs> you know, in, in, in this war, to, to give their uh, flesh and, 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 and blood there. Uh, and uh, as uh, Anna just <clears throat> said, there are no uh, any clear goals of, uh, of Russia in this war. So it's always changing. So from one side, uh, you can uh, you can hear uh, that 
Russia just want to keep the uh, territories that uh, it, it already uh, control. Uh, uh, in the same time, uh, you hear uh, regularly from Putin that the final goals of so-called special military operation uh, must be achieved, and the final goals is, uh, is control over uh, all uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's, it's a regime change of Ukraine. It's what Putin uh, called uh, denazification and demilitarization. So these goals are are still are still there. Uh, so it seems that uh, he uh, his um, uh, strategy is very depends on on uh, the conjuncture on uh, what he uh, he uh, could uh, gain. Uh, and he uh, he will uh, he will uh, catch from the situation as uh, as, as as much as uh, possible until uh, he he will be stopped in, in in some point. So in this sense, I think uh, that uh, any let's say uh, significant unsuccess of the Russian troops uh, will uh, create a true uh, you know basis for some uh, peace talks will give Ukraine a much stronger position in these peace talks. Uh, so uh, in Russia, well, you see the, the preparation for the next uh, draft. Uh, so the rise uh, of the age uh, for the men for the draft uh, now uh, uh, came from uh, 27 to, uh, to 30. Uh, so, uh, according to new Russian laws, when you uh, got the, the uh, letter, uh, like from uh, army, in the same moment, in the same uh, minute, uh, you are not allowed to leave the country. Your uh, driving uh, driver's uh, license uh, are um, uh, will be. Um, suspended uh, and so on so so uh, basically uh, basically it's uh, uh, it is very uh, very strict very uh, repressive uh, type of uh, enforced uh, uh, you know conscription uh, conscription to the Russian army and then uh, as you mentioned from the beginning of this new uh, year in in school in uh, in the universities, uh, the number of new courses, uh, like so-called patriotic courses, uh, were, uh, were introduced. So, for example, in uh, universities uh, now, it's uh, obligatory uh, for all the students to uh, study a so-called uh, DNA of Russia course. Uh, that means uh, that the essence of uh, Russian uh, state, <laughs> the essence of Russian history, which is a sort of perpetual war uh, for the glory of the country, for the uh, glory of, of the empire, uh, the permanent expansion uh, of its uh, borders, uh, somehow rooted uh, in the in uh, in in. Uh, in, in blood, <laughs> in spirit of, uh, of every uh, Russian. And it's uh, very much uh, similar to the classical uh, fascist uh, ideas. For example, the idea of uh, Benito Mussolini, uh, that the state uh, is, is not just institution, but it's a kind of uh, spiritual, uh, spiritual force, uh, spiritual uh, entity. Uh, so uh, all that is uh, is definitely very scary, and all of uh, that mark uh, the uh, the ongoing uh, preparation for the long term uh, uh, war uh, from the side of Russia. I wanted to ask Hanna Perkhoda. You are a Ukrainian historian. You're a socialist. About the concerns um, of. Uh, people who say neo-Nazis in Ukraine are being strengthened by U.S. support or the West support for the war. We had on Ukrainian-American um, journalist Lev Golenkin, uh, who said Azov is a hub for neo-Nazis to come to Ukraine from the United States and other places in the West to learn to fight, much like Islamists in different parts of the Middle East uh, recruited uh, Islamic fighters. Your response to this? Um, 
Well, there is a lot of things to say. Uh, first of all, about this uh, mythology around uh, f and the fact that around this idea promoted by Russia that Ukraine is somehow has uh, a large right-wing uh, groups uh, who are numerous and exercising um, a large influence on the Ukrainian politics. Uh, I would like to stress that even after the five years of the war in, in Donbas, after the Crimean annexation, uh, the, uh, during the parliamentary elections in Ukraine in 2019, the coalition of extreme right, of right-wing forces, only had 2% uh, of, uh, of votes and uh, didn't manage to uh, go to the parliament. So basically, Ukrainian parliament, you wouldn't find uh, right-wing parties represented. They were represented before uh, 2014, but uh, now this is not the case. And also, after uh, all these years of war, Ukrainians, which are supposed to be, uh, like Putin says, uh, uh, right-wingers or uh, even they, he called them fascists, they elected a Jewish Russian-speaking president who was openly opposed to the ethno-nationalist agenda. So uh, right-wing forces in Ukraine, they do exist because, as I said earlier, Ukraine is a complex society, not a homogenic one, uh, and it exists like in the other European countries. Um, however, uh, the right -wing, extreme right-wing forces uh, didn't manage to become a legitimate political subject on the, um, uh, in the institutional politics. However, yes, they are present in, in the army, but their presence is now kind of uh, dim uh, diminished because, well, Ukraine has one million of soldiers now who are defending the territory of Ukraine. And 99% of these people are ordinary Ukrainians, not belonging to any political party, political force. Uh, so it's kind of strange to think that Ukraine is infiltrated, the Ukrainian army is infiltrated by, by the Nazis and the uh, right-wingers. Uh, and you have also, well, at the same time, you have these Azov battalions, but they were under Zelensky losing their uh, influence inside of the, of the Ukrainian army. So I don't want to say that the problem of the right-wing uh, ideas of the right-wing organization is an existent in Ukraine. Uh, of course, it's existent. We as progressivist forces, uh, uh, left-wing uh, 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 forces in Ukraine are like facing this problem, uh, you know, in a very concrete way, in very personal way. Um, uh, but also, I think it's uh, it could be an irresponsible uh, thing to concentrate on the presence of uh, right-wing uh, organizations in Ukraine and to forget that the extreme right uh, in Russia is actually in power and is currently waging a war of aggression, a war uh, that is justified by the uh, kind of discourse that could be called in incitation to genocide, though this is the things are kind of, you know, very serious. And it's kind of a pity that uh, this, there is this disproportional perception of uh, the right-wing threat in, in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, so, yeah, this is my response to that. I, I, it, it could be developed, of course. Uh, uh, well, Hannah, but, per, uh, maybe per, Ilya could add something about the right wing in Russia. We actually have to better. leave it at this point, but this is a con discussion we will continue to have. Hannah Parachoda, Ukrainian historian at University of Lausanne in Switzerland, member of the European Network for Solidarity with Ukraine, and Ilya Budraitskis, uh, exiled Russian historian and political theorist, author of Dissidents Among Dissidents, Ideology, Politics, and the Left in Post-Soviet Russia. They're on a speaking tour of the United States, organized by, by the Ukraine Solidarity Network. Ilya is now at the University of California, Berkeley.